see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Unites people. Armies, gold, flags, stories. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. If you want to stand out from everybody else, you need to get into storytelling. Draw a different frame around the same set of circumstances and new pathways come into view. Welcome to Artifact Live with me, Scott MacArthur where we look at the art and science of story. We don't care who you are, whether you're a bricklayer, a professor, or a speaker. All we care about is you being a good storyteller. Thank God the drummers arrived. It's time to realise that facts tell, but it's stories that sell. Get me some nasty and get it now or someone's getting shot. And that's a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche. Thousand comments. Selling a hemorrhoid cream to someone who's got hemorrhoids. Got a whip. I was born into a deep contradiction. This stuff's magic. God, that's so clever. I was standing on a stage in... It was a very small stage. I think there were about 50 people. So it sounds like it wasn't an auditorium at all. <laughs> yes. um, it was Boulder, Colorado. And um, I was introduced um, that evening as the first, the first words that came out of the introducer's mouth was, this is Nick and he's a storyteller. And I took umbrage to that. <laughs> and I didn't know why. But it felt strange to be a bit kind of riled on stage. I don't usually get riled at pretty much anything. Yes. I don't react to much. Um, but I thought I'd do the, do the person the honor of trying to work it out right there and then. Why does that, you know, why is calling me a storyteller? Um, why, did, why didn't it seem true? Mm. And I know that most of my films, up, certainly up until then, had seemed like stories because stories what came out. But actually, it points right to the heart of the way of it, which is the opposite to how most people would go about interview or extracting a story from someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the, the longer the short of it is, I had never looked for a story. I'm looking for the experience essentially of the interior world of that person. And that sometimes doesn't even have words. And if I go there, then where the words come from is a very, very different place. Hmm. And that's what I was, you know, that, so that's what I was trying to work out. This was probably 12 years ago or something like that. Um, and to give you an, a, you know, a, a good physical example of this and you know, some of it may ring true because I th there were stories and there were stories. Sometimes someone tells a story mm -hmm. and for some reason it's intoxicating. Yeah. You know, you, you, you're, you're hanging on every word. You're totally what people might term present. And it's like there's nothing else. Yes. But more often than not, that's not the case. Someone's telling a story. They've told it a thousand times. The words have lost their charge. There's no... Uh, you know, I suppose one way of saying it is there's, there was no energy in it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I noticed what that's about. And through the process of, you know, nearly two decades of essentially filming this human soul, or, or, or should I say exactly filming the human soul, because that's what I've been up to um, for a very long time. I realized what was going on or what was not going on to make that occur to have that feeling. And to give you an, uh, a quite, 
quite a stark example. I, I remember filming uh, in some place once. I wasn't meant to film. I was asked to go somewhere. It, w it was actually a leadership institute, uh, a philanthropic leadership institute, and they'd asked me to really go along and, and have a look at the nature of what they were doing and give some sense of, um, I suppose, my, my view on it. And on the last day, someone said, or the, the person who who was running it said, could you film Nick? And I happened to have my cameras there. And by film, I mean, what I do is I'm essentially, if you're looking from the outside, it looks like I'm interviewing someone, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm doing the opposite. Everything here is the opposite, by the way. What I'm going to tell you and why I call it <laughs> challenging is it's the opposite. So I set up and what I do is I, you know, someone would sit with me probably just a meter, meter and a half away. You know, we're close. We're going to be, if we're going to talk at all, we're going to talk about intimate things, things that generally haven't yet been said. Um, and I broadcast the image out of the camera onto large screens so everyone sees what I see and I think that is terribly important That's lovely. so because otherwise what you are is you're a you're a fly on the wall you're looking in from the side mm -hmm. and so you're not really a part of the conversation you're like a voyeur in the conversation mm -hmm. and that's how I make my films so I film you know, almost like we've got it set up here. I'm, I'm right down the side of the camera. So the, the viewer is included in this experience of someone. They're not looking in from the side. And so that's how I had it set up. And then goes out the invitation. Uh, you know, there were probably about 20 people in the room. It was towards the end of their time together. And I thought, well, maybe no one will want to take this strange invitation up mm -hmm. uh, but everyone did in the end but the first person really characterizes the way of this and really maybe even the answer to where the words come from which I've noticed so vividly over the, the many years person walks up sits in the chair as you'd imagine in fact he, I think he kind of had a spring in his step when he came to the chair, you know, if there's an invitation out, it's like you almost you feel, you know what, I've got something interesting to say. I've got a contribution uh, for the, you know, for the audience, for the world even. And he sits there and, and, and starts to talk. But I know where those words have come from. Mm. Because most of the words that are ever said have some almost need attached to them. They just do. You know, often the need is I want to contribute to the world. I want to help you. I want to help you get to where you want to go. I want to help you resolve this issue. I want to make you feel good. Or they might be the other way as well. You know, I want the world to give something to me. And and so most of the nature of most human encounters are that. It seems a, a little of a, a dark view on it, but I think that's what it is. You know, we all need something. And so we're in the world trying to get somewhere, and often our words are in service to that. I know that because I've noticed what words used to come back to me in the camera and I used to sit with those words and I used to uh, film a lot of famous people in the early days, especially when I was in London. Um, and I used to watch those edits back and think, wow, there's a very dramatic story here. But that story has been told for a reason. And I, and I noticed how I felt and it was you know, almost flat. Yet I would film someone else, and and it was intoxicating. Yet they were talking about pretty much nothing, and no one had ever heard of them. What's that about? And I started to notice notice the nature of it. And so this person walked up to the chair, sat in the chair, and started to talk. And I had to say, um, you know what? I, I've just learned that in my style, I like to start in a different way. And he goes, "What do you mean?" And I say. I generally like to start from nothing, no thing, no act, no word, no, no thing, no need to do anything, no need to contribute to us, to the world, to anything. So all you have to do is simply sit there, you know, maybe close your eyes, because I love getting a shot of someone with their eyes closed. There's something about it. I love to take a lot of portrait photographs as well. It slows the world down. In fact, this way actually stops the world. 
important because what happens is someone suddenly, consciously or unconsciously, realizes, well, there's someone here who doesn't need me to be a certain way. He's just told me that even if I don't speak, say a single word, that that's enough, which is, you know, the heart ready of my invitation. And, and I believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. I'm quite happy just simply sitting with someone. In fact, you know, if we if we just sat here for a, a while, you know, for the rest of the time and said nothing, that would be, to some, it would be awful. Just like, what's the point in using this time of mine if it's not going to help me get somewhere? Mm -hmm. For many, it might be a blessed relief. It's like, oh, God, nothing. Interesting. I am, um, I've got quite a few things I'd like to unpack a little bit from what you've said, just so I understand. And um, you talk about um, the soul. I mean, your one of your film series is called Soul Biographies, and it's where I first came across your work, Nick. I think I've said that to you before. And um, what what do you mean by the soul? <coughs> Strangely, I'm not sure I've ever defined the soul. Um, I. I don't define many things here mm. because I think it's utterly mysterious, all of it is, yet yeah. we know it when we experience it. Yes. What I'm really talking about is the, 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 the this inner world, this world that goes on. It's almost mm. like in another plane, yet we live it all the time. Mm. So if I go back to this story of, of this person in the chair, you know, what happened is instead of marching up to the chair and saying these words yeah in this way which would have given us a real a real indication of what he'd been up to in the world and and it turned out he was a u.s congressman <laughs> um and he he you know it, it seemed like a good opportunity to talk about you know contribution and service yes. and whatever and i think i know how those words would have felt being they would have been interesting they might even have been inspiring in some ways uh, but what came when there, when we started with no thing was a voice from a different place mm -hmm. so instead of this person this film subject talking to me or at me like so many of us do to each other yeah. much of the time instead of them talking to or at me it was like they were being spoken like the words were coming through and i don't mean well i do mean that in a strange way it was like he was being spoken Sensitive. through yeah and so the the whereabouts of those words was somewhere very different and to me i i've done this so much i mean day in day out for you know as i said nearly two decades I've noticed this, where the words come from are different. They feel different. The nature of them is different. Everyone, I mean, I feel, I've filmed so many people, thousands of people, and the characterize, the characterization of this is, one, people lose sense of time because they're not tracking time. Mm -hmm. Two, they actually lose sense of the words or memory of the words. They don't quite remember. They just remember how they feel when they said them. But it's almost like they're stumbling through their sentences without stumbling. It's yeah. like you started a sentence. I have no idea what's going to be on this side of the full stop, let alone the far side. And so now those words are bristling with this charge. And yes, so often a story is being told, but it's almost like a story is being told from a very different place. This interior world, not this exterior world of pretend that we often, well, always play, you know, like here's a chap called Nick, he's a this, he's a that, he's done this, he's done that, to give you an, a real sense of someone that I want you to see. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is is I'm, I'm unknowingly revealing myself utterly with nothing in the way, no, no sense of, of wall, no sense of guarding my words. It's just unbridled authenticity in a way. Yeah. It's, there's nothing 
there's nothing holding this back, almost like I'm not even saying the words. What happens, and what happened in that instance, it was extraordinary. Like these words moved, I think, everyone in the room to tears because it was an articulation of a life of service mm -hmm. that had never been said before yeah. because of where it had come from. And so what I've recognized in storytelling is so much of storytelling has a specific point to move the world to somewhere that the storyteller presumes it should be or could be. But storytelling, it, when one lets go and is simply spoken, you're in, I don't know, in the moment or whatever. In other words, you're not in control. Yes. Has a very different quality. And what is revealed about that person is something different. Mm -hmm. I would call it the soul. It's the I call my the way, although I'm very careful about the process because I know the process is nothing, mm -hmm. is to let go of everything. But I call it inner view because I'm I'm essentially catching an inner view of a person. Mm -hmm. And th that to me feels a certain way. There's mm -hmm. just this this almost this bristling experience of inter interconnectivity mm -hmm. you know like I, i'm the same and that's what people feel or can feel if they would pay attention to the films i make or the experience in a room you know whether it's a small stage or a big stage or a room with 10 people in or a yes. auditorium with a thousand people in there comes a point where you're paying attention and this experience of someone is their interior landscape that's what you're seeing and that draws you in to a place where there's nothing between you. Mm -hmm. And you can't necessarily describe it, but you know it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of haunting. And that's what I would, I, I would probably call the soul. You, you've had this experience of someone. It feels like you belong to each other mm -hmm. almost. And you don't know why. You, you can't even remember necessarily what the person was saying or what if you were talking to them, what you were talking about. But it didn't. It doesn't matter. Like we were, like we we met last week, you know, for a pre chat or a whatever. I remember you. I, I remember what it felt like to be with you. Mm -hmm. It was great. It was like, oh, I'm so looking forward to mm -hmm. this time to continue this adventure. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I said I would start to talk about, um, you know, these lessons. I'm kind of bored with the lessons. I'd rather just, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like, I, I, oh, it's so dull to, yes. to, for someone to be looking and going, well, what can, what, uh -huh. what can I get from this time? Because when you do that, you're, all you're doing is looking on the horizon. You're not paying attention. You're thinking, well, what's in it for me? What can I, what can I learn here that will make something oh. called the future better? Whereas we could just not do that. We could just, Make you know, it up. Uh, I love it. It, 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 and I said this to you once before. Um, I it's so counter what the the perceived wisdom is with with lots of things. So, for example, even doing this show, everyone out there, not everyone, but nearly everyone out there, says it's got to have agency. It's got to solve a problem. It's got to be like a search engine. It's got to solve, you know inspire them it's got to give them tools it's got to, and and if you look at the the the, the vlog and the, and the, to some extent the, the podcast landscape it's full of that and i find it really boring you know i i, I find I, I don't like like you i you know you pick up a book and it's seven steps to this and five step and it's like oh god you know um that's the first thing but the second thing that really intrigues me about your work and it has done for ages as I, I said to you when we were doing the pre-brief that I'm a when I was a kid I was introduced to the beat poets the the Scottish one which was Hugh McDermott and then I, that led me into sort of Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and, and that school of you know uh, poetry and most of that was done as what they called the stream of consciousness they didn't sit down with a plan they didn't sit down with a structure they just let it come often with tubbed up to 12 using you know some 
psilocybin or whatever, but they were, you know, they, they, that's what they did. And I am just over there. I've got Jack Kerouac's original um, script for On the Road, and it's one sentence. The whole book is one sentence. And I've often thought about that and how he got to that. Is that related to Because I think that came from his soul. Uh, I mean, it's all over the place at times, but there's something incredibly beautiful about it. I absolutely adore it. It's one of my favourite books. Um, is that similar? Or is that a different thing altogether, Nick? Am, am, I, am I coming at it from the wrong sort of No, it's a, it, it, it is exactly the same. Right. Okay. So when... I mentioned at the beginning or the title of this, where do words yeah. come from? It's far more profound than where do words come from? Yeah. So where does everything come from? That's the <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah. When I picked up a camera for the very first time, hmm. it came from nowhere. It came from nowhere. I was sitting and I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't pretty much doing anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in a hotel in the middle of London and there was nothing and there was nothing and there was nothing. And there was more nothing and then there was something yes and it didn't come from any physical stimulus yes it wasn't provoked by the view of something or the thought of something it just came mm. and i followed it but more importantly than that i realized that the very way of filming of the way of paying attention to someone the way of talking came was exactly the same it doesn't come from a response to something. It comes from nothing. Okay. One of the very first films I made was actually on <laughs> quantum physics, strangely, and I called it something <laughs> from nothing because yeah. that's the nature of what they've seen when they go back and they go back and they go back and they look further and further and further and then they suddenly say, well, there's nothing and we can't explain it. But it doesn't need to be explained. Not everything needs to be explained. Mm. You can... Uh, that was a, an amazing thought that I had years ago, which took me totally off the hook. Whether I can explain this great mystery or not, it's still going to work the same. So I'm off the hook for having to understand it or explain it. I yes. can just be in it. So um, sub subsequently, a few years later, I wrote this poem. And I, I, it probably took me a decade to work out, oh, there's something to that. Um, it was called The Tree of Dreams. I'll, I'll read it to you, actually, huh. if, I can, um, if I can find it. All right, here you go. Uh, it's called The Tree of Dreams. Uh, it said, many had gathered under the tree of dreams. All but one stood shaking its branches for dreams to fall. Dreams that had been whispered to them by the voices of others. Dreams that would fade with time. But one sat quietly waiting for a dream to recognize his soul and to consume him with no doubt. And so where, where does it come from? Mm. Where do your dreams come from? Where do your words come from? Where does life itself come from? Mm -hmm. So what my observation in these many years has been that most people, most of the time, are living their lives to become something like the human experience really seems to be an experience of becoming driven by this sense that we're not quite enough uh. and it's exhausting it's uh. perpetual it never ends yes it never ends and there's no peace uh. and so you're always driving i'll do this because so you know many watching this perhaps might be thinking uh well i'll watch this so i might discover something to help me on my way Mm -hmm. um, that's why the podcast world and the, the, the human world is pretty much full of features and benefits. Work out what people want and tell them you can give it to them. Yeah. Very little is done, or not enough is done, out of a stream of consciousness. You do it just because. I don't know. The sky told me. The ether told me. That's how I run nearly everything. Mm-hmm. Ether told me whatever I don't know what to call it even it's just a sense of something it didn't come from a need to have this change or that change it just I just knew and I don't know how I knew yeah but I know the experience of knowing I know it very very well actually I don't always um, attend to what I know uh, I try sometimes try not to but what if you could 
what what if you 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 could live a life like that what if you could let someone speak from there mm. i mean that's the art of witnessing as i see my interview thing it's like um my job is not to it's not to to really ever ask a question unless it absolutely seems like i should mainly it's just about not even being there I'm not even the witness. The witness is the ether. Sometimes space is space and nothing is the most extraordinary thing. Mm. And what if you know, what if, if great stories come from this place? What if the only way that you can really experience another person is from that? Because otherwise everything that you experience as someone is is a conclusion of them. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at you and uh, I've just made all these assumptions about all sorts of things, the things in the background, the things that you emailed me, the things that I managed to glean online, uh, your accent, your, your the look of you. The, it's like, oh, it's exhausting. By the time I get to see you mm -hmm. through all those things and all the needs that I have, mm -hmm. you're a conclusion. Mm -hmm. Or I could do none of that. And I could just let the experience of you come to me. And uh, <laughs> do you know if I can interrupt just for one very short question? Um, have you ever done this with children? Yes. Um, you know, I just put a film up on Monday, mm -hmm. and it's not a film film, it's photographs. And there's something about it. I was, I had set out to catch the soul of America. It was a big job. Gosh. It does have, it does have one. <laughs> uh, I haven't finished, uh, nowhere near finished, but I know where it is. I know where the soul is of everyone. You know, if you, if you don't look, there it is. The very act of looking actually seems to send it away. But I was in a th third grade, which is 10 year olds class in Tucson, Arizona. And it was a hundred, I think it might have been 120 degrees outside, which is irrelevant inside, apart from the fact the air conditioning was so loud that I couldn't really film because <laughs> I couldn't scrub that audio piece out. Yes. So in the end, I'd, we, we, we were together for a couple of hours and I said, look, I think I'd just love to take your photographs. And it was amazing, you know, like it, it was so full of energy. And I... And I looked at those portraits the other day and I realized oh, it's, I can't stop looking at them. There's something about in the eyes of, of those particular kids. Mm -hmm. And I, so I recorded some guitar and stuck it up on Monday. It's, it's kind of intoxicating in a way. Uh, it's a slideshow film, I guess, not a real film. Mm -hmm. So no real dialogue. Um, well, no dialogue at all, actually. Uh, so yes, I've done it with children and, and I've filmed kids in other stages as well, and they tend to be much closer to the surface. So you don't need yeah. to, you, because this is one of, what we're talking about here is undirected. Mm -hmm. So the thing that gets in the way is you assume that you need to do it in a certain way to get to a certain place. But what if you didn't have that? Mm -hmm. What if that wasn't in the way? And uh, anyone's capable of it. So child or, or not. I mean, age probably, uh, age probably dampens one's closeness to it, mm. one's capacity for it, mm. and then you lose sight of it maybe. But in any moment, you know, the flick of a single heartbeat, you're there. I've I've experienced that. I've filmed I filmed a multiple murderer in jail. Same look in his eyes than a modern day saint. It's it's there. It's just covered, but the thing is, this experience is there. It doesn't need to be conjured up. I, I've I've learned that. Uh, I think that's, uh, in fact, that's probably the most profound thing I've noticed over all these years. That there's this journey in life, and everyone is is just trying to, I suppose, trying to feel good, and whatever that means. Mm. I just want to feel like there's life isn't. S s so fractious that there's not that I, I don't want to live a life that just feels like there's no peace mm. 
always fighting it, always, you know, sometimes it feels good and then it feels terrible and uh, and I'm not in control of it and I want to be in control of it and I want it to seem like I've lived a good life and I want to achieve all the things that people have told me I want to achieve and I look out at the world and the world tells me I'm not quite enough and I could be there and I could reach higher and I could be over there and uh, with this and that and and, and there feels a lot of pressure, so there's no peace. So I just want, I just want peace. I just want peace. What I've noticed about the experience of peace is that there's nothing that one has to do for it. Mm -hmm. It's the it's the opposite way round. And so, if one, well, just in a moment, you can you can recognize that, and I. You, you recognize it not because you did something special to conjure it up and make it happen, but just because it was your natural state. It was just there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, most of the events I do are just about that one thing, really. Just a surrender. In other words, a giving up of all the things that you think you should be doing and ways you ought to be and things you could get better at. All that. What if you just start with nothing? What if you sit in front of the camera? And, and let go of it all without it even being a thing, you know, that, an act of letting go. Yeah. It's nothing to do. Mm -hmm. From there, you're basically in a, you're in a stream of consciousness, yeah. you know, because it is mysterious. Mm -hmm. But that is there all the time. It doesn't need anything. It's just there. And, you know, when, when, when you approach storytelling, as, you know, we were talking about, yeah. the most extraordinary experience of people and words that form into stories you know the articulation of the most extraordinary things that happened uh, come from that place mm -hmm. yet we seem to try and be in control of it so much and I guess a lot of storytelling uh, actually you know without being too rude about it is probably propaganda mm -hmm. in a way in other mm -hmm. words Yep. You know, maybe propaganda slash advertising. In other words, I'm going to tell you a story so that you think something that I want you to think about me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what I think you need to hear in order for you to, I don't know, dot, 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 fill in the, the benefit. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's so tedious and it's so, it's all, it's, in, in a way, it's terribly dishonest as well. There's a real dishonesty in our relationships with each other, or there can be. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly there's not. And suddenly when you don't hold anything up and you're not you're not you're not doing everything for a reason, mm -hmm. you're doing it just cause, just cause, just because. Um then it, it gets it feels different. I, I remember um watching or listening to Krista Tippett talking, you know, the on being. <coughs> oh, I'm sure you know on being. I know, yeah, I yeah. I know. She, uh, my father-in-law built her offices. They're done. They're just down the way. They're about. I, I was going to say they're local to you, yeah. yeah. And Krista does something like that. I mean, one of her guests. It's, it's not attributable, and so I can't. I'm sorry, I can't attribute it. But one of her guests said of Krista, she said, "You know what? Listening is like touching at a distance." And I, I remember when I first heard that, and I thought, because everyone talks about, don't they, again, putting the armor back on, you know, the, the, the corporate yeah. stuff back on. Listening skills are really important, and you've got to demonstrate understanding, and you'll eventually gain some empathy. And, and there's almost like a, a scaffolding around that. But Krista, okay. yeah, Krista, Krista never does that. Krista will do a bit like what you, you, you do, actually, I think. She will give them... It's not the same. You you give them nothing, and I understand that. She gives them perhaps what I would call a generative question. So she starts all her shows with, you know, regardless of whether you're of a person of faith or not, what what was or was there a spiritual aspect to your growing up? That's all she says. And more than half of her audience, guests rather, are are, are, are atheists. You know, they're not. They're not. She's a theologian but more than half of our are not they're scientists they're poets they're engineers they're <coughs> from all different walks of life and that means that and she just leaves them alone she lets them talk 
and I think it's a stunning podcast because it it it, it never goes down. A, there's that slight, there's that little bee in the bang. You know, it's a bit wanky to say, but it is. It's a bit like that. It, it gets them going, Nick. But then she just lets them go, and she just sits back, and it feels very, very intimate. And in fact, when you see it on YouTube, because she does do film quite a few of her episodes, you can see her reacting to those words. She's open to that. She's not thinking, I need to get a story out of this person that's going to sell this product. I need to get a story out of this person that's going to sell their, you know, and mm. it's beautiful. That's the way, if anyone ever asks me about it, I say, it's just beautiful. Just watch, just listen to it. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I've never heard um, Krista's style described as you're describing it. Mm. Strange, she's, uh, she, her kids went to the same school as our kids and we were just... <laughs> And yeah. I know she's a friend of my father-in-law's. I've never met her actually. So oh. I really ought to go down and, and meet her. But um, she has a way with her. Yeah. But I wrote um, I'm, I wrote a, a little piece which is is quite um, indicative of this way, and I, I want to read it and then listen to it myself and think mm. about what you said about how she does it. Oh. Um, and and this is. I wrote it a long time ago and realized that, oh, this kind of, it, it really describes what I, I would call, I call interview, but witnessing this ability to pay attention to someone. And it's called undivided and so still attention. Before your words of encouragement and well-timed advice, before items gifted at beyond an arm's length, did you ever consider the one thing that might turn the entire world on its axis, your undivided and so still attention. And really, I suppose, what I recognize this nothing thing being is, there's nothing needed. Just speak into the sky, just follow your words. I'm not yeah. gonna try to work you out. I'm not gonna yeah. try to, to do anything with it unless I really feel like I ought to. And, you know, my style, is I suppose sitting very still with someone and mm. just I just know that this is enough and from something from nothing comes something and even if no words are said it doesn't mean nothing's coming I've had people sit in front of the camera for hour and 47 minutes with a large audience watching is the record not that I'm counting <laughs> oh, it sounds like I am. But often people will sit for long periods of time with no words. But of course, the experience of life is is is, is reaching everyone. Of course, there's something going on. Yes. Um, and I suppose Krista must have this extraordinary capacity to, to what you be call be present mm. with someone, to not get in the way, to remove the pressure the, the, that is so often exerted on someone unconsciously uh -huh. because we all feel it if someone's there and you're feeling the pressure to do a good job to tell a good story uh, the words come from this this fearful place this place of constr of pre-construction almost yeah. and i'm you know i'm i'm never looking for this this place of pre-construction if i can help it i would i, I don't even mind like people often ask, well, what's your favorite film? I say, I don't really have one. And they go, surely you must like the joyful ones as opposed to the opposite. And they go, no, you know, I've like I've made films of people who have lost children, some sometimes in violent circumstance. The most they're most extraordinary yeah. when you've given the space for someone uh, to just speak and not know where it's going to go and yet still hold with it and they're totally desolate and there may be no way out and they've just realized that that's the most haunting experience i would prefer that than a made up happy experience you know someone holding a smile on their face um yeah, yeah absolutely which, yeah that so this kind of bristling authenticity and and christus i don't often listen to it but I heard one with uh, John O'Donoghue. Oh, yeah. I, I've listened to that maybe, well, many times. Uh, there's something yeah. about it, and you hardly hear her speak, I think, and I think that's probably how she does it. She just, you know, it's. I, I always feel you just, 
nothing's required when someone's off talking from a deep space it's it's an explorative space on their part. They don't know what they're going to say. They don't know where it's going to go. They're just speaking. They're not looking down a checklist of this is the direction I'm going to go. They're off piste, totally off piste. Yeah. There's no path through this conversation. Those are original. Those are the things that you, you know, I think that's probably when you said the the beat, the beat Nick poets, you know, yeah. whatever they're called, the beat poets, um, Jack Kerouac and stuff, stream of consciousness. That's it. That's that's liberation. Yeah, you know, to to uh, now, what if what if if one's life could be like that? <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean that's. I'm sure many people, yeah, you know, even kind of colliding with this conversation between us, would be thinking, "Wow, you know, dare I?" But you have to lose control. Yes. Uh I think the the word that's just popped into my head is is courage. Because, why? Because I don't really know why. Because I think well, uh, let me think. It probably, and I'm talking probably coming from my own perspective here rather than trying to anything else. Um, I've often felt certainly when I was in the corporate world, Nick, I didn't have the courage to to really take control of myself. I, 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 I think I'm, I'm perhaps mirroring something you said earlier, but I would, you know, get into the job, perform in the job, there's the job description, you know, then get promoted, get promoted, then be in charge. And all I would do would be push the same crap out that everyone else had done successfully over decades and had good careers. But I think, well, I don't think I know... 15 years ago, I became like a tire on a bicycle. The, the tread had gone. I just wasn't interested anymore. And I couldn't get enthusiastic about another project, doing the same thing that I'd done 10 times before. It didn't matter if it was glamorous, you know, it might have been in Sydney or Beijing or whatever. And I was like, oh God, here we go again. And I had to leave. And I think that how you've described what you do has reminded me of that, that that was a, like what John O'Donoghue would call a, a threshold moment. You know, I, I, I had to, I had a choice to make and I thought, bugger it. I'm, I'm not doing what they want me to do. And I left. Um, yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I did. I, I made, I think I made life up from this stream of consciousness in the beginning, early on. Yeah. Like I was uh, an explorer of sorts. Yeah. I crossed the Sahara at 17, 18 years old, um, canoed the Congo, canoed the Amazon, traveled the world, climbed mountains, just made stuff up. And yeah. then I fell into business. Uh, yeah. It seemed like I was never very serious about it. Mm -hmm. Ended up as managing director of a company called Mintel, one of the Mintel companies. Uh, you know, everyone had heard, everyone thought we were a really big company, but we weren't, not that time, it is now. Um, and I couldn't work out why. I, in fact, I said no many times, but they just kept on asking again, would you do it? And so I did it and I, it was a good job, but just not for me. And I had to stop in the end. And I realized that in the absence of not knowing what to do, I couldn't do the same thing because I would yeah. never, I would never be, I would never be, I didn't know this, but I would never be struck by this notion of something from the ether. Mm. This thing that I didn't construct, it found me. And that was really the way around, you know, where do words come from? Yeah. Well, they come from me talking to you or at you, at the audience, or they just come. Mm -hmm. Where do where does your sense of life come from? Direction, yeah. sense of uh, aliveness. Pur pur I'm not even sure about purpose, to be honest. But where does the sense of it come from? Mm. Does it come from the construction of what you've seen and you've worked out and you think would be a good thing? Or does it just come? Mm. Does it just arrive and you know um, and you get to a threshold moment all, all the time, really, and, yeah. uh, or much of the time? Yet you don't do anything about it for fear of what might happen. Mm -hmm. um, but they, you know, so I yeah. guess there comes a point sometimes where yeah. you just think, ah, oh, there's too, 
it, it just wasn't it wasn't working and you couldn't work out why so now you change something mm -hmm. but i'm not sure anyone doesn't collide with those things all the time yeah. That's often i suppose when i stick a camera up that's the opportunity that one could catch i could catch on film yes is an opportunity where someone has just given up trying to explain away anything actually even given up looking because mm. i'm sure that something a, a a 13th century mystic poet once said rumi <laughs> was his name he said something like what what you seek is seeking you i, I know that's my experience but it uh, also when i start to think about it it's always there just kind of silently patiently waiting but you have no real chance of of catching a glimpse of that catching a sense of that if you're so busy yeah uh trying to get somewhere so yeah. slowing down is no good mm. stopping dead is is good is good in that respect like the the removal of everything that needs to be done mm -hmm. is an extraordinary thing and it and it's it's almost in a moment of no time that that's realized and it's when you realize it and you and it, you suddenly become aware of it now something can happen with it and so you know what krista does in uh in her interviews on on being I suppose I, I would imagine a lot, a lot of the interviewees are actually probably struck uh, by their performance. Or yeah. it's like, wow! Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I felt I, w I was free when I was doing that, and I wonder why. Mm -hmm. Because I've been interviewed many times, but the interview always has a list of ten questions, yeah. and yeah. it's yeah. kind of waiting f to ask the next question, and is wondering whether I, what I'm saying will be received well. You know, all that kind of thing. So much like most of life is um, just kind of you're in control of it. Mm. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah, let, let go of the control. Let go of the control. I think looking back on where I encountered this, um, I had like a, a fish hook in my mouth and that was money because I grew up in a council estate outside Glasgow, you know, any minute we were on the street. I mean, it was, it was, mum and dad did the best. I'm not saying they didn't do the best. They did their best, but we were always that, that away from trouble. And I think that fish hook kept, put, I think it probably still does pull on me that, you know, I'm only one mistake away from nothing again, you know? Um, and I think it took me a long time. And I don't know if I'm there yet, if I'm absolutely honest, Nick, um, to remove that fish hook, it's gonna hurt, you know. But it, it, it's kind of, it, it, it's there, and it has an impact on me all the time. And I've only ever mentioned that once ever. Not that metaphor. I've never used that metaphor in my life before. But I've only, I remember once, and and I'll keep this very brief. I was in a forest with my friend Julian, and we do this every year or so. We we go and we build a fire, and we just sit and talk and meditate, and listen to the forest. And that's the only other time I've had that thought. You've just made me think of it. And I had, I, honestly, that is, is the first time I've used that metaphor. But I think that moment of realisation, what's actually behind where you're trying to go, is hard to find. At least I found it hard to find. Maybe not everyone else, but I did. And it's still there. If that makes sense. But... Uh, I, I'm feeling almost hesitant to ask you the next question, Nick. That's interesting. I've never felt like that again in one of these. <laughs> Normally, I end this show because we're, we're coming to, to our time. Uh, I ask my guests to bring an artifact along with them, you know, that they can tell a story about. Do you still want to do that for me? Well, I have. Uh, I mean, you did ask, and I have a yeah. couple of things, but I'm more fascinated by what you just said right yeah i'm fascinated by what it must have been like you know growing up on the edge yeah 
and and then I, I I was just thinking, wow, you know, you you went and you listened to the forest. Who does that? Probably everyone should. Mm. Um, so what you're really listening to is something, a different voice. Mm. Uh, and then I th then I was just wondering, it's like, wow, you t you said, and I and I can see this, and I just. Like this, this sitting on the edge of you know it all falling apart and losing everything, always sounds like such a terrible thing, mm. and I, and I know that, but I just I suddenly wondered whether it's not whether it's the opposite, you know what what if that is the thing that, like, makes you feel, um, hmm. I, I don't know I just suddenly could be it's kind of, it's kind of really interesting. I, I mean, the, 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 I tell you the consequence of that, not on me, but certainly on my family. My dad to this day consistently says to me, I still don't know what you do, what you do. And I consistently respond to him, neither do I. <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, I was expected to go into the, the metal industry, into the Gart Kosh or Ravens Craig, the heavy engineering world, or onto boats because most of my family are from the Navy or fishing stock and I didn't do either of those things um, and I think that you'd have to ask my dad but uh, and my mum but I think to this day they still don't understand because there was an expectation I guess Nick for me to go in a particular direction which I didn't do largely because I had a, a very good grandfather a mentor who said to me you know do what you want to find what you want to do and do it which was great advice to a 15 year old growing up in a council estate outside Glasgow. It really helped. But I, yeah, it's interesting what you've just said. And maybe it is, maybe it is the driver. I've not thought of it like that. I've almost thought about it. I think the pain aspect, I think that's probably where that hook thing probably came from. Cause I, as I said, I've never used that before. So um, maybe taking the hook out is too painful. Maybe, maybe that's it, but maybe I'm just bullshitting. I don't know. But the way the way the way to to wonder about that is mm. is space and time. Mm. You know, this is how. You know, if you were sitting in front of the camera, which I suppose you are, not that we got the time and latitude for this, yeah. but it wouldn't even be to ask a question of that. You know, mm. you'd say, "Well, what would be best now?" It's like. Well, nothing, no thing, no act, no wondering about it, no trying to work it out, no trying to tell a story. You know, what if we just, you know, just kind of sat here with with this? Mm. That's wonderful, Nick. That's where that's where that's where it comes from. That's where mm. this magical quality of of the inner world comes from in a in a just a moment of of nothing almost mm -hmm. and i know we haven't got the latitude to explore it it's a shame we didn't get here earlier really yeah i suppose yeah. we're so you know you think that bog oh, what fools eh yeah. you know we think the word podcast and we think they need to fill it with words and I suppose they're interesting in a way and there might be something but yeah really I mean even even that is something that frustrates the hell out of me sometimes and I'm talking about myself um because I certainly if you look back I mean I've done I think this is episode 62 of this and I've been so fortunate. The guests have been amazing. It's been an unbelievable, fantastic experience. But at the beginning, for the first 10 episodes, I spoke too much. And I learned quite quickly that I wasn't doing the Krista Tippett thing. I wasn't trying to copy Krista because I couldn't. But I thought, wait a minute, Krista doesn't talk very much. She lets the guests talk. And I stopped talking. And it got better as a consequence of that. And... I think, but that was hard for me. You know, it really was hard. You know, I'm one of these people that if there's a silence, I want to fill it. At least I used to be. Um, and it'd be funny 
what people think when they watch this because a lot of the guests know me quite well so a lot of people know uh, quite well. you just got into a, an observation there so yeah. you know krista krista starts with something sets on fire they talk it fills yeah. the podcast that's it you know much like you, you haven't you you've asked a few things i've talked but mm. my real if i'm being honest my real sense of some of this time is like god i'm bored of talking <laughs> like you know I don't, I don't mean bored of us no no like, i know you don't i know you don't no no i, I suddenly got this yearning for like well what if it was both of us doing that what if it was not filled with so many words what if it was filled with a lot of space between you know it was finally getting there you know you you said something or i might have also gone to say something and i don't know where it's gonna go yeah then there's space that's useful for everyone yeah. i think because it's so unusual mm. and it's a thing that is a great contribution is is really quite simple mm. the space mm. um so little of it at the moment it's unbelievable <laughs> well no but there's the same amount of time there always was it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a choice yeah. i yeah. live a, a very quiet life in a way you know yeah. i i live almost an entirely interior life yes um well, not entirely interior you know it's yes. busy here where i live and and stuff but there's that inner world stuff is always there it's always going on it's kind of running the show really mm. um and well, it doesn't seem to have many opportunities to come out and articulate itself maybe it doesn't yes. even need to uh, but to notice that it's there and to notice that um that it has it got a voice it's got a, a sense to it and that sense is it leads you somewhere you know what you seek is seeking you so it was the other way around so instead of pushing your way through life in this kind of musculature yeah. uh, muscular way that is always trying to get to over there and sure you've, you've worked out that someone told you you should and maybe you yeah. should be a bit more original but what if life itself was trying to live itself through you mm. as opposed to it was your life and you're the one to live it to its max or to its best what, what if you weren't that wasn't your part in the equation i suppose that would be in a sense a life of faith without any you know sense of dogmatic anything you know mm. religion or anything just a a life of wow but, um i can talk like i could write an essay in a single sentence with no punctuation my english teacher would would would, would <laughs> roll over in his or her grave I, they're probably not dead but um <laughs> if they were um yeah but i th this is it's not like you're not making it up it's like life's making it up and living itself through you there's a wonderful sense of liberation and stuff in that yeah. and what might how might we be together like that? Like I come and listen to the forest with you. It was my favorite thing in the entire world. My artifacts. I got. I got this compass. Um, it's kind of cool. So I used to be a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. And, yes. Operation, um, but I never knew where I was going. You know, I, I, I used to pour over the map rooms in the Royal Geographic Society, yeah. head off to the Amazon, to this little tributary. Yeah. There were aerial maps taken post Second World War, but I knew they were inaccurate. So, you know, I got this compass from about 19, uh, it's about the 1900. Um, Wonderful. It's kind of cool. But I know full well that in this inner exploration, uh, th there is no direction because there's nowhere to go you just let the world find you yes and i had um i had my guitar as well here and yeah uh, as my other artifact not that you said i should bring two but i, I just my sense of playing guitar like i, I kind of made it up i haven't really had lessons mm -hmm. but i play all the music on the back of films i didn't know you did that actually yeah uh i made a film once of um a guy called dominic who's stings guitarist and writing partner of many decades and I was filming him and it, I met him at an event in Apple. I was talking on filmmaking and he was guitaring and 
um, I said, your, your music would really suit what I'm doing. I'm just making up. And he said, you play. Why don't you record? I, went, I, I don't know how. And he showed me, and I ran home. Mm -hmm. he was, I lived in Clapham, on Clapham Common, and he was down the bottom, down the hill. His house was down the bottom of the hill back in, in Battersea. I ran up, and I went home, and I plugged the guitar, and I've recorded ever, ever, ever since then, wow. for years and years ago. And, but my music has no start and no finish, really. They're just these kind of, I don't even know what I'm doing. It's a stream of consciousness, totally and utterly. I recorded for that film I was talking about, you know, that slideshow film with the yes. kids. I, yeah. record, I have no idea what I did. I couldn't play it again, ever. Um, I, I might be able to work it out, but it just started with two notes, and mm -hmm. there were two notes, and I liked them, and I, I plugged it in, and I just played something, put something over the top, and it was done. In 15 minutes, the whole thing was done, and then stuck it on this loop and stuck it on the film, and it feels... It feels the way I do, um, and I don't. I don't even have a name for it yet. Uh, I <laughs> seldom have a name, but it, I like the way it sounded, so I just do yeah. that. I just make it up as you go along. Very good. Um, except it's not me making it up. It's like through me rather than by me, and yeah, maybe that's it. Through, you know, like if it, yeah, a life through you rather than by you. Why you know, I, and so coming back to where the words come from. You know, yeah. that's the question. Where's it coming from? Yes. Where's my urge to speak am i talking because i need you to understand something and and by implication i'm kind of important and you think um you know there's something in it or am i saying something because i want to help you mm -hmm. or you know there's, there's a need in it or mm -hmm. did, am i just saying it because you know did i just mm -hmm. kind of start to talk and i don't know where it's going and i'm just kind of i'm following it um where did it come from? It's the question. Where do words come? Where does your life come from? Yes. Uh, dare you let go of the control and just let life have its way with you? You know, <laughs> and it's like you're acting on instruction almost. You're acting on feeling. You're acting because it, it's filled your bones. Mm -hmm. It's filled your bones with a sense of, I, I can't not do this. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you do have a choice and it, it's terrifying in a way until it's not yeah until you realize like you you know even with the fish hook in mm -hmm. and going down this path and your parents still go i don't know what you do and by the way mine always said the same thing um most people don't know what i do yeah and i can't even I, to be honest I, I know i can say i'm a filmmaker yeah but underneath it all it's so utterly mysterious that i that it's ineffable is the only ironic word i've got for it mm -hmm. the word for there are no words it's ineffable but maybe life should just be ineffable maybe life shouldn't be explicable and yeah. controllable maybe you could just let it out and yes. we'd, we'd be better for it and your relationships with people would be better for it and yeah. the things that you worked on would be in service of all rather than the few or yourself and maybe I don't know. Well, I guess we, we, we should we should end. Once again, you're reminding me, I mean, one of my favourite writers, uh, the late, great Christopher Hitchin, uh, once said in a response to a question, where do you get your, your, your ideas from for your, your, your books or for your responses to questions? He says, I look to the numinous. And that was so powerful because he, he didn't have any magical thinking in him. He 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 was he, but he trusted his mind, as he often said, to to come up with the right answer or an answer. Maybe not the right answer, but an answer. Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you and sharing this space with you. Um, if people are interested in your work, where would they best seek seek you out? I've got a I've got a few websites, but the main one is called Soul biographies s-o-u-l not s-o-l-e as <laughs> it's not about <laughs> fish um soulbiographies.com right. and there's a there's a vast library of of yes. humans mm. shot in that style you know all shapes and sizes and races and all, all sorts there and shot in this style so there's a, a huge library of things there and and then um, I have a, a list that has been going since 2005, actually, and every Monday, well, mm -hmm. actually, it's not every Monday. Sometimes I don't get around to it, but most, most Mondays I film, uh, I send out a film 
of you know and they're short mm. usually well they're usually between one minute and eight minutes something like that but just an experience of 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 humanity with nothing in the way the yeah. human soul if you like uh, and some words which, which are really just attempting to give you an experience of nothing really you know so uh, what i'm doing is nothing i'm not saying we'll learn this or learn this or here's an answer it's ready to cast you into the place you know that's maybe you characterize well by saying listening to the forest mm. that place so i have well you can join that if you like and then i do other stuff you know i make films for people and then i have these um i don't know what to i call them expedition retreats and they're can you imagine being in front of a camera with nowhere to hide yeah absolutely nowhere to hide mm. um, and a bunch of people a small group of people also willing to let go utterly of any sense of control mm. uh, that is wild and mm. mysterious and it's caught on film I, I do that quite a lot as well as I, I do lots of things um, but soulbiographies.com is uh, where it all tends to emanate from. Nick Askew, thank you very much for coming along to Artifact Live. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I didn't mean to get invited. I just, uh, you wrote a comment on LinkedIn, I think. And then, uh, anyways, it started there. So yeah. there we go. Fantastic, Nick. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott.